more people that showed up. All right. Wait a minute. Well, okay. Are we, so we are ready to go. So Edwin, hello. Yes. Edwin, please wait. Hold on. Oh, I thought we had to go. Okay, go ahead, Edwin. All right. Uh, hello, and welcome to our monthly speaker program for Beikai. Um, for any who aren't aware of Beikai or who haven't previously been here, uh, we are an organization here in the Bay Area of the local chapter of a larger and larger organization and another lar parent organization, organization beyond that. Um, our mission is to raise awareness and and encourage folks to inter interoperate. I don't know um, to have interchange along um, user experience lines. So that includes everyone from academic uh, those who work in academic circles, those who work in industry circles, and those who are in. I guess, industry as practitioners, as user experience designers and usability researchers and so on. Uh, so we are a volunteer led organization. Oh, Smitha, would you like to share your slides? This is me just speaking off the cuff, but there are slides. Uh, so this is us. We are <laughs> the local chapter of SIGCHI, which is a special interest group on human-computer interaction. ACM is our uh, parent company, our parent organization. And uh, we are a, a volunteer-led organization that has membership fees for um, if people want to join. So here we have some of our, a list of our are uh, some of the benefits that you get along the way. Uh, one of these bullet points is mentions birds of a feather meetings. And one of the main ones that we have going on right now is essentially a, I describe it as a support group for anyone who's a UX professional, a user experience professional. And that happens on the balance of the, the month. So this is the second Tuesday of every month. We have a, a speaker meeting. And we also, so the Birds of a Feather meeting called UX a Life and Careers that happens the fourth Tuesday of each month. And it is also run uh, over Zoom. That's something that I host. Uh, everything from whether you're in a, in a position and running into frustrations that only other UX professionals will understand to uh, people between gigs looking for their next UX adventure, uh, to people who are looking for their first UX adventure. You're welcome to join. There's information on our website about how to join it and uh, hope to see some of you there. Next slide. Ah, so uh, as a volunteer led organization, we have volunteer positions that are available and um, here's a big list of them. If you can find out more by emailing uh, volunteer at bakehigh.org. And we do a lot of our organizing uh, at our steering committee meeting, which is the first Thursday of the month. Uh, you feel free to email that email address to find out more about that. Next slide. Ah, so uh, every month we have a free um, presentation with speakers about U various UX topics, and those are organized by our program coordinators. And Smitha is our program coordinator who created this opportunity. So I'll hand the podium over to her. Awesome, thank you, Ed. Um, there was one uh, tidbit that uh, one of our organizers that a lot of you know, Nancy mentioned uh, about Nicole, who's our speaker today. Uh, when uh, 15 years ago, she said that game mechanics would increase engagement for all software. 
And lo and behold, <laughs> uh, here we are uh, with gamification. And um, yeah, so she'll talk to us a little bit about, um, you know, um, the uh, principles of VR, XR, all of it, everything surrounding that. Um, and uh, she's also the creator uh, of Four Key Ways to Fun, which is a framework to understand uh, games player involvement, engagement. Um, so we'll hear a lot of um, fun terms and cool terms that um, uh, she talked to us regarding the metaverse, uh, how to apply all of these principles, whether you're doing, um, you know, uh, haptics, uh, photogrammetry, which I hope you'll explain more of, uh, <laughs> ML, light field displays, all of that. Um, so Nicole, if you uh, would like to introduce a little bit more about yourself and the stage is yours. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Smita and Edwin and, uh, and Nancy and Steve uh, and the rest of the Baykai uh, volunteer team for having me and thank everyone for coming today. Uh, I'm Nicole Lazaro, as Smita said, and I, among other things, I designed the first iPhone game and I was the first person to actually use uh, Pollockman's facial action coding to uh, measure em discrete emotional states uh, in the uh, in players, people while they played games, and that's what you know created the uh, the four keys to fun that you know Smith was mentioning earlier. So uh, there's a lot of a lot of great talks about the four keys in depth uh, uh, about game mechanics and all that. Happy to answer questions uh, that I don't get to you know in the in the talk itself. What I'm going to do today though is I'm really going to be focusing on um, holograms, user experience. That's you know, what's coming, sort of what's coming. Because in my work with games, I've been working, well, I've been working in VR ever since, you know, QuickTime VR in, you know, 20, um, uh, 20, not even 20, uh, in, uh, you know, since 1992, 91, something like that when QuickTime VR first came out. Uh, but I've been working really hard uh, in, uh, since, you know, 2015 uh, with uh, doing everything from, you know, virtual reality fully occluded to the pass-through type of AR and uh, mobile, mobile VR mobile AR, mobile experiences as well. So uh, without further ado, I'd love to get in into it. And uh, excuse me, I should uh, share my, let me uh, share my screen and hopefully people will be able to see that. Is that uh, nods of heads? So yeah, people, can people see that? Great. Fantastic. All right. Well, this is me actually suiting up to jump into alt space. If people know that I was the first person to actually demo publicly their articulated avatars. So I had like 26 sensors on the body. We didn't attach the toes, to be honest, but it was pretty cool. Uh, as uh, we mentioned, did the uh, first, you know, iPhone game, and this is the four keys to fun. And it's really the language of how interaction, interactive language to uh, create emotional states in the body. Uh, Will Wright's a big fan, and it's been used by millions of developers around the world in games, and then, of course, now gamification. Uh, here are some of our, you know, clients that we've worked with in the XR space and some of the press uh, that we've gotten, you know, over the, over the years. Uh, and this is just a real quick peek. So this is where a lot of my experience is coming from, is being the lead developer and designer uh, for Follow the White Rabbit. And uh, here we're seeing it in, uh, you know, in Gear, v, uh, in Gear VR. Uh, so basically, it's a, basically you put the headset on and then you're in this cafe in Paris. Uh, it's 1889 and the world is, even the world's fair, you can see the Eiffel Tower out in the distance. And uh, if you think about it, VR, XR, you know, AR, all the Rs, they really, it's really this trip to Wonderland. And I grew up in Wonderland. Uh, overseas, I was in the Middle East and as a kid, I rode camels, climbed pyramids, explored fire temples, you know, in real life. And I want to go back and feel that same, you know, full body wonder I had as a kid. And XR technology is the first thing that we can actually do. I noticed there's this question in chat. Yes, I did design the first iPhone game and it was a game called Tilt at the iPhone dev camp it happened week after the launch of the iPhone. We launched it again uh, as an iPad on the iPad first as launch title on iPad. And uh, it's called Tilt, Tilt World. You see some of the art behind me here. That's from, uh, from Tilt World. Plants, trees in Madagascar uh, based on the points you earn in the game. You just rotate the phone to play. And happy to talk more about that, you know, in a little bit. Uh, here's just some of the idea behind uh, Follow the White Rabbit. So again, like we're in this holographic world. We're in a 3D space that's a three, we're inside a 3D world of, uh, you know, of CGI, of computer graphics. You can interact, in this case, with a, with a gaze cursor. Uh, here we see it a little bit in the inner interaction. Uh, I'm wearing a vibe on the other side there. Um, but if I, you know, gaze at the painting, it'll come towards me. 
And so this is uh, what we call 3 DOF, Three Directions of Freedom uh, VR, uh, for this version. And I can bring the clue closer to me, and then I can solve this cryptex. And then in solving the cryptex, I can then grab um, the, uh, the reward, which is a little bellows here, and then pick it out of the painting and, uh, and then move it to the, uh, to the imager. So just like, just like that. So a very different kind of user experience. And uh, it was quite unique, especially for the time, because this was uh, coming out in 2014, 2015. Uh, so let's let's get in though. That's a little bit of my background. Let's go ahead and drive into uh, UX for, for for holograms. Now there is a metaverse, which we can also people have questions at the end, like what the word metaverse means. There's a metaverse of topics around user experience uh, for you know for holograms, for holographic you know uh, interactions. I'm going to focus on just these uh, five topics here, and uh, as a consulting company, we consult you know on all of them and more with uh, with our different uh, with our different clients, uh, and everything from we worked with early on with the Facebook's Horizon team to uh, people developing you know the you know latest and greatest you know kind of VR game. Uh, so we work that, and then also in, in corporate in corporate as well. And so we're going to look at uh, a list of uh, a list of these things. Uh, to, to gay today. So probably, hopefully, most of you have seen this. Uh, Kichi Matsuda's, his amazing work. Uh, you know, basically, it's the hyper-reality nightmare. Just Google it and play it there. It's really amazing. And the, uh, the work here is really, it's, a, it's, a, it's an artistic expression of like what we want to avoid. And what we really want is we want to have a human-centric, which is why I'm here. That's a, the theme for today, since it's Kai. It's lovely to be back at Kai, actually. Uh, it's a it basically it's a human centric design approach for uh, for the metaverse, you know, for these realities that we're creating. Uh, this definitely is a depiction of a non human centric. It's just completely exploded and exploitative of the people that uh, inhabit it. Um, the other thing about the metaverse and uh, UX for holograms is there's no wimps. And there's no wimps in cyber, cyberspace. There's no wimps in cyberspace. And for those of you who can't, who everybody in this call, I think, should have it. But you know, that means windows, icons, mouse, and pointers. Uh, I heard this in an early, uh, an early Beikai many years ago, and I thought, man, we just really got to get out of this wimp paradigm. Uh, now we can. Now with with uh, UX, with three dimensional UI, we can actually do that. Next sort of still first generation UX is uh, I really don't like to do laser pointers, rods, fish tanks, and game controllers because those are all like layers of indirection. They're very first generation UI hardware and stuff like that. UI um, and I define UI as the uh, as the actual hardware, the actual visuals, the actual controls, and I define UX as the experience that that hardware along with the interacting you know creates. So we're doing UX for holograms. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about some UI stuff, but. It's that how do we create a really next generation experience, advanced experience, and it's not simply by using a laser pointer and pointing at something. That's a, that's a thing. A rod, like a fishing pole, you know, that people will do that to bring an item closer. This is the HoloLens, and you know, unfortunately, it's like the next gen HoloLens. Um, they have a fish tank selection box, you know, and then you rotate the sides and stuff like that. Uh, and then definitely not, you know, game, you know, game controllers. Instead, what we want to do is we want to have direct interaction. So how can we encourage you know, user experience direct interaction with our content? Here I'm wearing the uh, Snap Spectacles. You might have seen them. Uh, these are the latest gen spectacles. So they are uh, an AR, it's a set of, you can think of it as a set of sunglasses. And unlike the Facebook ones that were announced this week, uh, these have been out, in the, uh, out to creators. I'm an early developer. It's not available at retail. Has two cameras, and then it also has two uh, light field displays. So that means that there are two. Um, I can get a stereoscopic CGI computer graphic image floating in space because it's stereo, and that's what uh, we're going to be uh, showing in in a little bit. So anyway, this is just these just put on like a normal set, and now I can see you. Well, I can see the flat zoom version of you anyway, and then I can also like launch an app, and I can actually see a hologram, you know, here floating, you know, floating in front of me. Uh, and I can and I can interact with it with my hands. So that's a very different user user experience than using a mouse, right? Than using a mouse and a pointer. Here's a lovely. I love uh, Denny's work here. This is his Twitter handle. This is what he just posted. I think today. Here he's got this lovely jelly interaction. So he's tracking hands with the skeleton hands, and then look at the the lovely control that he's getting uh, for this virtual item. 
this would be even better with haptics, really even a lot better with haptics. Uh, but right now this is bare hands and he's just rolling things around. That's the kind of direct interaction, direct manipulation and textures we want in the interactive world when we're working in three space. Uh, so it's, you know, it's three dimensional UI, three dimensional interaction that we want to have and we need three dimensional controls. So if uh, we can go back here and try, yeah. So hopefully the videos are playing for everybody. But this again is uh, Kichi Matsuda and lovely use of the hand as an interface. So what you want is you don't want it plastered, the UI, you don't want the UI plastered like on the screen because it kind of feels like a wet newspaper, like it's just there all the time. So where else can you put it? Well, you could float it a little bit and then it still kind of feels bad or you could put it on something in the world or in this case, can we, you know, put it on a hand? Now we do have some accessibility because let's say you only have one hand or maybe your hands are not the same shape as everyone else's. Uh, but this, there's some really great interaction that can, uh, that can happen. I use this example because this is the first, I think this is the first example I saw of using the hand as the, uh, as the base point for a, uh, for a UI. There've been lots of other experiments since then. Uh, then, uh, so including what we've done. So this is a uh, follow the white rabbit. This is uh, when we go to the Mideast, we go to uh, Aladdin's Cave of Wonders. I'm not sure if people can hear the audio from the, uh, uh, from the video that we're seeing. But uh, here we go into the book. So I use my hand to go into the book. And now I filled the room with CGI trees. So I filled the real room and you can actually walk in the CGI forest. But the forest is cursed. So just like the cave of wonders in Aladdin, uh, it's filled with treasure, but if you touch any of it, uh, in this case, the cave collapses. And we all know if you die in AR, augmented reality, you die in real life, so that's not good. So we're going to go again, and we're going to be careful. And uh, this is an example of a player. So we're playing it on Magic 8, the special sunglasses. And uh, if you find the lamp and unlock the lamp first, as part of the puzzle, then that breaks the spell and everything. It looks kind of funny, but from inside you see this uh, 3D world mapped into your real space. And you see it's kind of transparent because that's a little bit about added light technology. Um, so anyway, yeah, so I've get, uh, I guess I'm getting the fact that the audio is just like way too loud, but um, so I turned the audio off. Um, yeah. So that essentially we were able to go through, I planted those trees in the world um, next to, uh, you know, in the world, and then you can actually walk around them. And if you touch the tree, you know, then, uh, then the cave will, you know, collapse unless you have the magic lamp first, and then you can gather as many gems and stuff as you want. In the, uh, in solving the puzzle and getting the lamp, we actually do finger spells. So the way in which you shape your hands, the shape of your hands unlocks the magic spell, unlocks this. Um, and so we see here a dark background, which is the dark room and a, a different room. And then we see here, um, things, the CGI images are tracking, you know, tracking my hands and the different gestures. So this is direct manipulation, just like you might be familiar with swiping on a phone, right? Uh, you actually can reach into this three-dimensional world and grab things and move things around. Uh, and so that's what we mean by, uh, by uh, uh, you know, by, uh, by, by hand, hand tracking, right? So we find, we find our spells, and uh, this is a little bit about how it, how it kind of works. In a sense, this is a gesture recognizer. So it's recognizing a gesture, like in this case, it's an L. Uh, there, are, there are different points. So HoloLens from Microsoft has about 26, I think, magically, but has a slightly smaller set. And uh, you know, the, uh, uh, a lot of other uh, do this. And then, but to get that pose, you have to kind of pose it. So from a UX perspective, I found it really challenging as a developer because I had to do, like to do a love spell, I would do L, O, you know, V, you know, I mean, I kind of make this E kind of thing, um, uh, but you had to hold the you had to hold the pose for quite some time before uh, before it would recognize it. And I'm talking about a second or a <clears throat> uh, a second or second and a half. 
And so we could put a little beach ball spinner going there, but then we would be like looking at like a pancake game or a pancake UI, right? On a flat screen laptop. Uh, so you need to have something else there for that wait time. Uh, wind gesture recognizer. So right now it's very, it's very semaphoric. It's in terms of doing the gestures, but when I want to do is I want to do that, you know, and that's the magic spell. Yeah, you know, I want to be able to just, you know, make these, you know, really cool signs, you know, like finger tut, like a, like the magic, the magician, uh, Dr. Strange, you know, in the Marvel comics and then have magic happen. Very challenging right now. <clears throat> Once we get the gesture recognizers, it's a gesture recognizer or simply hand tracking to be as fluid and fast that we could actually do ASL, like American Sign Language, where it could actually recognize that. Then we're going to have a whole, a whole bunch of really great things uh, coming out. But right now we're really limited with uh, both the speed of the recognizer and then anything that has a Bluetooth connection, uh, you'll have a, a quite a bit of latency from 10 milliseconds to 100 milliseconds added to any processing that's happening on the device. And so then, so what the next, this next little bit here is about what, what happens when we're actually editing in mixed reality. So one of the amazing things like with, uh, you know, this is the Magic Leap headset, probably some of you, hopefully some of you have, have actually tried. Again, it's a set of sunglasses. There's actually a, a pair, you know, stereo, but then also two light field displays in each eye. And uh, you can see through the sunglasses, so you see the real world, but then you also see the glowing, uh, you know, additive light display that, uh, has the compute uh, that has the has the image or the game whatever you want to put 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 there or the screen of you know, calculus and stuff like that, uh, but all the compute is happening you know through a cable on this um, on this light uh, light pack so this is the uh, the uh, the engine the computer. Uh, what's really amazing about the new spectacles uh, is that uh, unlike you know like a Bose AR so this is the Bose AR which is um, just audio only no cameras just audio and a head pose. Uh, but there's no visuals here. Uh, with the snap spectacles, you can actually have, you actually have visuals. So all of the, you know, so here I've got sunglasses, I can see you, and then there's the CGI that happens on the screen in stereo. And then uh, there's, you know, there's motion tracking in the, you know, in the headset, there's pose tracking so that you can look around and have those experiences. But all the computers on board. So there's no wires and there's no, uh, there's no, um, there's no, uh, there's no Wi-Fi or anything like that. So it's all, it's all on board. And uh, that makes for a much more seamless uh, inner you know, user experience. And so I can take this and I can just, whereas I'd have to suit somebody up to, you know, try, you know, to do the magic leap thing. I'd have to like put it over their head and, you know, you know, give them the light pack and stuff like that. All I have to do is I just have to hand somebody, you know, this, you know, this set of sunglasses and they know, and it's, oh, okay, I just put them on. And then their friends like, oh, wait, wait, come over here, see something cool. And then they could just hand it right there. So we're getting there. Definitely. There are many, many people, many, many companies working on this project. I'm really liking the, uh, the stuff I'm using that I'm build, building with the spectacles. Now, what I've found for user experience is there's some really interesting stuff. And probably the most amazing things I've found is the experience of editing holograms, you know, in the real, in the real world. It's kind of editing in mixed reality. So here's a video of me. <clears throat> kind of mocking up an interaction. So I've got the spectacles on and I can see what you can't, you know, I can see this glowing cube in front of me. And then I can look down at my laptop, adjust settings, you know, and then push a new build to my headset, for example. And I can edit sort of in this, in this real, in almost real time, almost real time. And the, the, the ability to like actually focus on a flat screen UI and everything and the keyboard, the real keyboard through the sunglasses, and then also have the hologram in the world with me or multiple holograms because I am working on a game uh, is just mind blowing because I can look at one computer. I'm working at two computers, the one I'm wearing, the one I'm wearing and the one I'm looking at and I'm working with. So crazy, you know, kind of really crazy, good, um, uh, good, good stuff there. Uh, and so here we can see me making, you know, making gestures and, uh, you know, editing, you know, editing on the keyboard and going back and forth. That user cycle <clears throat> is quite a bit different as a creator is quite a quite a difference as a creator. So that's just that's just amazing. Uh, what I see from my point of view is something more like this. So this is the cube. All right. Uh, it's a little washed out because of the light background. So I brought it down here in front of me in front of my laptop. But you can see that that cube is like it's floating in the air in front of me. It's floating in the air in front of me. And uh, that's just that's just really just pure magic because I can I'm working in mixed reality. So I've got one computer that's flat screen 
and all of it. And it's got a little preview window of a flat version of the thing. And then I've got a real stereographic. You're just seeing a flat version in through Zoom. But in uh, when I've got the headset on, it actually is rotating in 3D. So I actually see that. And then I can prototype out interactions. I can do gestures and you know, get those controls really, really, really fine. So you see that I've got two lines of interaction. I've got the holographic world floating in front of me. And then I've got the computer world, the, the, the control world or whatever that I'm programming it with. And then I push it up to the headset and then I can see the changes happening in real world, which is interesting because I'm making a room scale uh, experience. And so not everything is in front of me at my desk. So I'm actually, you know, often having to like, you know, all right, hit render, you know, hit, hit build or whatever, you know, run it to the, uh, run to the glasses. And then I have to go and like turn around and walk to a space that has enough room for the hologram to fit. Uh, so really interesting stuff in user experience, you're designing user experience. And this is really, this is really mixed reality because I've got the holographic reality and I've got the real world reality that's editing the holographic reality. So there's some really interesting uh, interaction. And then if you look at tools, uh, the tool space is really gonna really gonna uh, explode. There's a lot of usability issues with uh, that are going to come up with people that are um, that are editing uh, in um, ideally we're not going to edit on a pancake monitor ideally we'd edit in in vr or something like that too uh, so evolving what's happening is we see some gestures so i think the pinch and drag is basically pinch and drag so pinch and drag and puppet mouth pinch and drag don't don't do this you know don't do that that that's really tiring puppet mouth pinch and drag is great uh, you know, grab and rotate or grab and rotate. Those are awesome. Uh, hand swipe. So like the minority report kind of thing uh, will work. And then selected states, you know, kind of glowing. These are all part of the emerging vocabulary of interacting with holograms a little bit more on the on the UI side. And as I mentioned before, gestures really need that fast response time or or slow feedback to hide the weight. So, you know, you can have this glowing power up interact, you know, animation as your gesture gets recognized and then boom, it's there and then you can cast the spell. Uh, so we need to, we need to hide the, hide the weight. So in addition to hands, we can also do eye tracking. This is a, I helped uh, Jim Margraff and his team at iFluence uh, create this uh, demo, a demo of their technology. Uh, where they're using, te you can see them demoing here at AWE. Uh, we did not work on the icons, um, but you can get, uh, you can actually basically browse the browse the uh, browse the internet, run a calculator, shop on Amazon, all just using your eyes, all hands free. Not enough time to go into, uh, you know, what what different eye tracking solutions there are, but that's an that's a uh, that's also amazing because it's very much. I have my hands and I also have my eyes. There's also some really interesting, challenging stuff when you do gaze tracking. Now we have eyes and hands, but now what about the body? Well, it turns out the body worn, body worn holograms is also a thing. Uh, thanks to Snapchat and Spark AR. Uh, here is a Rift, pay, uh, Don, um, Don Allen did this amazing lens. So Snapchat, this is on the, um, this is on the, uh, on the phone, I believe. I, and uh, you can look at the, you look at a person and it puts this digital costume on them. Uh, it was a celebration of a concert happening in the game Fortnite. And then on the right, we have another one, which is uh, another designer, uh, Inglis Damara. She's got some amazing stuff that came out this week. And again, these are digital holograms that are worn on the body. So they're using body tracking to place the uh, digital uh, clothing. And then they move, they move around. And as they move, the, clothes, the digital clo layer of clothing moves with them. Um, I believe there's been some great stuff happening in, at New York Fashion Week and at the Met Gala, you know, about around that. But not only are we doing, you know, so that's actually, you know, body is user input, right? There's the user, the usability of it. The user input is actually this, the whole, the whole body. So you can do body segmentation, it's called. Uh, and uh, then you place it in 3D so you can rotate the body. And then there's a 3D model around it. Lots of very fun stuff. But we could also use the body as a controller in a different way. So probably, hopefully a lot of people have heard about the ABBA voyage, uh, the avatars, you know, so they're basically... Uh, in the upper left, this is how they really look, and uh, you cannot get mocap suits to look all that nice. So you know, I I, I appreciate the bravery. <laughs> I also like that they're wearing skirts. I thought that was a rather interesting touch. But um, they are then using these uh, skins to power digital skins of themselves, which is according to what was announced this week. Uh, that's what they're going to look like, uh, and they're going to do a virtual concert dressed up as avatars. And everybody's going avatar crazy. On the, on the right-hand side of the screen, we're seeing now alter ego. And with alter ego, what's happening is it's actually a, a singing contest and the uh, performers are all suited up as, uh, as their alter ego. So they're in mo suit, motion capture suits and they are performing. 
uh, yeah, for a uh, you know for a very well esteemed you know music uh, musical um, uh, musicians musicians. So yeah, Will I Am and uh, uh, Lisa Morstadt and stuff like that. So those are those are some things about the direct interaction. So you can't get more direct than actually moving your body, right? You can't get more direct with when we when we do when I do user testing. You know, people are always like they've got their hands out there like a three year old, just like they want to grab stuff, they want to throw stuff, they want to be in that. They don't want to be like on a screen. So really making sure that we interact with holograms in a natural way is super important. The next step, which I alluded to in the uh, example of Aladdin with our game Follow the White Rabbit, is we really want to have a real world integration. And so uh, how do we integrate the real world? So the world is not, you know, if you're in a frame, you know, you just assume, okay, that's the iPhone, it's got a black back, you know, so I can't see the world through it. But if I'm using mobile AR, I should see through and, I, and it has to respond to the world around it. Uh, and this, this one here, it's called See Real AR uh, by uh, Dr. Helen Pap Papaganis, and she's doing this on NREAL, and she was actually probably the first artist to actually sell an NFT of uh, an, AR, an AR experience that she created. Uh, she did some really, really, she's done some really great, she's done, you definitely should follow her feed on Twitter. She's got a lot of really great art. So not only is it, you know, uh, transparent, it goes through to stuff, you're like, what is the world? The world and the hologram are interacting together. And here we kind of see a really nice integration of theme and uh, and color and stuff like that for for what the art is depicting in her you know in her hologram and this is 3D and it's animated. Similarly, uh, those of us in the Bay Area, I'm not sure I would show hands if we were all like, oh, you could actually do the virtual hands if you want. Um, but the virtual Van Gogh is still running, and uh, Unreal Garden Two is out now. And Unreal Garden is, has a hardscape, there is an experience, and then you put on the, uh, this is the Microsoft uh, HoloLens 2, I believe, uh, and it will project onto that uh, interesting lit, lit um, uh, surrounding, uh, it will, it produces holograms, it, um, <clears throat> it, uh, it does, uh, it projects holograms. And so you can actually interact with them, or at least in Unreal Garden 1. I haven't been yet. I can't wait. Uh, but in Unreal Garden 1, you can actually reach out and touch and touch some of the flowers and they bloom and that kind of thing. Um, not a whole lot of interaction. I'm hoping for more interaction on this next, this next round. Not very much interaction at all um, with, un, with a virtual Van Gogh. And here we see, this is an example of what we call a KVR, which is where they're projected, um, where the, the 3D or the immersive experience is projected onto the surfaces uh, of the environment that you're in. It's also true somewhat with Unreal Garden, but they also have the holograms that are just floating in front of you because, I'm, because you're wearing you know, one of these uh, stereo displays. Again, smart sunglasses with a, with a, with a view. Uh, this is another interesting thing where you can add additional layers of meaning because it's 3D, it's a little bit easier to understand. Uh, so from a UX perspective, uh, this is uh, Flow Immersive and these are run this is running on Magic Leap and they put down a map on the floor of this, <laughs> this guy's garage and uh, this was the, an animation of the COVID spread. And so you can see it in 3D and kind of experience the data in 3D, uh, which, is, which is really, which is really, um, uh, um, which, is really uh, which is really better than just like a flat screen. So yes, to answer the, per the question in chat, yeah, it is, I'm using the word hologram to be uh, you know, three-dimensional graphics. And hologram, definitely when you're using an AR, so you're using you know, one, of these, uh, one of these headsets, uh, with the with the sunglass kind of idea, it's actually floating in the air in front of you. If you're doing the um, you know uh, VR, then you've got a lot more control because you don't have the outside light coming in, and so you can actually do um, you can do quite a quite a bit more. And it's still holographic, I would say, because it's three dimensional and you can interact with it. This is an example of using a 3D video AR overlay on uh, what used to be a real forest in uh, at the CCA campus, which is just you know, right over there. So they cut down about 14 trees, and I was uh, uh, taking a tour with the, land, the new landscape architect and saying, look, you know, you cut down all these trees. This is what it could be like. And what I did is I took a stereoscopic, you'll see it in the, in the very center there, I took a stereoscopic view of walking down a different park with lots of trees, and then I overlaid that, if you will, on, on, this, you know, on this walk. Uh, and so you could see both the real 3D and then the virtual 3D together to kind of give you an experience. The next generation of this would be, this is a super quick prototype, uh, you know, smoke and mirrors kind of thing. This uh, simply using video capture on the device and then playback.
but I would love to anchor it in space, you know, put in some anchors and be able to walk through either video, 3D video, share shot a video tube, or you know, maybe some video bubbles. So you really get the sense of like what, what happened um, and what, what the community really wants, which is uh, a nice place to walk with lots of trees and not all these tree stumps over here. And uh, you can see the Broadway traffic, which is pretty yucky. Uh, to get there, to do that, to anchor in space, we need to map in the world uh, and the, the world mapping um, uh, we need to map in the space. So like I said with uh, Follow the White Rabbit in the Aladdin Cave uh, chapter, is we have to, uh, in, order to, in order to project into the world, we have to map out the, uh, the structure of the floor, right? What, where is the available area for trees to be planted? And uh, where is not? And, and can we get, can we navigate? And then we hide the lamp someplace. So we have to understand what the, what the geography of the world that you're in. And then it's gonna be different regardless of, you know, in the different rooms that, you're, that, you, uh, that you might take the experience. Uh, in the Unreal Garden case and in the Van Gogh, they know exactly what that experience is because they've designed those rooms. But if I'm giving you, um, you know, something, this is on the, you know, the magic leap, but if I put it on here or one of these, we don't know necessarily where it's going to be. And so we have to really map. So part of the user experience is uh, where can we, where are valid places for that uh, hologram to exist? You know, so, I mean, I might have a, you know, a bookcase right here or a lamp right here. And so the, the hologram can't intersect the lamp. We have to have it create a depth map of the, of the, of the, entire, um, of the entire room that we're in. Uh, either on the fly or prior to, you know, starting the experience or gradually, you know, fill it in as you go. Uh, and then that, that, so this is, you know, so this is like, you know, in addition to that, we also have this opportunity for real world understanding. So this is using, uh, you know, machine learning, and this is a marker technology. This is on the, um, I'm filming it on the next gen spectacles, uh, the feature that was available uh, to the flat screen uh, Snapchat already. So I'm hoping everybody in the Bay Area or in California on the call has voted. It was very important to vote today. Uh, and there's a, but there's something about, you know, being able to uh, basically recognize this as a mailbox and then be able to position the graphics and then know what day it is and be able to uh, create an experience uh, like, you know, like this. This is a bit of a prototype. I don't have all of those features. Uh, this is actually, yes, to answer your question, yeah, this is actually AR. So I'm actually looking at the, um, I, I took a flat screen video. Actually, I took a, a stereo video, but I can't project it in, in stereo because you don't have a set of these glasses. But if you did, you would actually see this in stereo. And so as you can see, if you, as I walk around, you can see the occlusion, the 14 comes in front of the mailbox, and then uh, the ballot is rotating, so it's always facing me. So this is dynamically, uh, this is dynamically changing uh, based on based on where I'm at, where I'm where I'm looking. So it's not a final effects or anything like that. It's not photoshopped in. This is actually live capture from uh, this new next gen snap spectacles. Uh, Yeah, many people do call uh, virtual reality where you can't see the real world, and this is AR, augmented reality, and where you can where you can see the world. And it really, the the spectrum between virtual reality and augmented reality is just the amount of the real world that gets let in. So if the glasses are really dark, that is completely virtual, and then if they're um, if they're transparent, then you can see. In this case, we can see the blended, you know, um, uh, reality uh, thing. And then the VR headsets now are getting passed through camera, you know, cameras, and so you can get that you can like see your real keyboard while you're in the Oculus Quest, for example. Uh, that's all. That's all happening as well. Uh, we had a, so photogrammetry was another is another thing. So how are we getting these holograms? Like how are we source? So this is something we've done for Follow the White Rabbit. Uh, I was using the uh, new iOS beta uh, for uh, photogrammetry scanning on the uh, iPhone slash iPad. This is, I'm doing the iPad. So you can see this is the quality of the scan. So I'm looking at, this is a video of the, of the scanned model. And now I'm going to reach in and, you know, voila, this is actually, this is the actual object. So I need, there's some lighting differences. They're different colors, but you can see the, uh, the quality that you can get in a photo grammetry scan right is quite amazing so what i did was i actually scanned it just by moving my you know my device my ipad around like you see just like you see here pretty much and i created this uh, 3d model with these photo textures these photorealistic textures and all of that uh, goes into uh the the um, the the game or the experience it goes into the model which can go into the experience 
Uh, a lot of the stuff we've seen for AR has been very light and very glowy because it's an additive light display. You can't, um, black is transparent, white is really bright because you have to like only, you know, all the light beams coming in, all the photons coming into the lens, uh, you can only add to what you're seeing in the real world. Uh, but we can get some pretty amazing textures. This is a uh, this is a you know, this is a traditional video of a uh, model, uh, you know, of the model and uh, the, uh, and the and the and its source image or its source and its source um, object. This is a stereogram, circa you know, 1903. And we can also do it in spaces too. So I've got in the foreground here uh, this photo uh, photogrammetry uh, scan of the CCA campus, you see Mackey Hall, the Treadwood Mansion in the distance, and then we have the trees. And so I've scanned it using a using display land, a different technology, again, just with my phone. And then I've laid in the background uh, some buildings to give people the sense of like, what will happen is if we add additional structures behind the wall, like what does it feel like behind the behind the building? What does it feel like? And uh, with this, which is like, a, I think it's like an eight story, seven or eight story building. And then, then again, like, what would it look like if it's got a 19 story like office tower? You know, that's, that's just going to look, you know, quite, quite overpowering. So here we have the virtual in the background and then a, um, a rough scan in the foreground. Here is another example. Um, this is of the carriage house, another historic building that needs to be preserved. And it's much happier with uh, these, although very dense, at least historically inspired uh, architecture than it would be if these were all simply office towers, um, you know, glass and steel, you know, kind of construction. And then one of them was going to be like 20 stories, you know, towering over these historic structures, which would be tough. I put a Google map on the ground there if you want to, just to get scale, the scale right, the placement right. Face-to-face uh, -face interaction is another thing that, that's uh, important to, uh, to take into consideration. This is Tilt 5, and this is a AR display glasses, so you a pair of ski goggles, right, again. Uh, and then this one, though, what they're doing is it's that they're actually broadcasting from the ski goggles onto a reflective mat. And the reflective placemat, large, uh, then bounces back, and then you get a stereo image of what's going on in front of you. And the nice thing about it is you could then turn to your other person and say like, oh, hey, and you could play a game or you can like look and see the person across the table from you. Uh, so which was much more social than us sitting next to each other, like, you know, with a, on a console game, watching a TV, and we're not really looking at each other. And so that's, um, you know, that's, I really am looking forward to getting mine. I'm not quite there. I'm not quite there. They're almost shipping. They're shipping. They've been shipping to the first customers. We're almost there. So uh, third and almost last would be, uh, so talking about some holographic displays, I thought I'd throw some of these in here uh, from, from the UX crowd. So this is like, if we think about foldable, if we think about bendable displays, now that makes the, the thing really, really super wearable. And uh, you can interact with it. It's not technically a projected hologram. They feel 3D a little bit because the, there is, feels like there's depth in the animation. Uh, but there is this really nice, you know, gestures uh, going, you know, going back and forth. Uh, but beyond that is stuff like Looking Glass and LumaPad. LumaPad just announced, I think, about two weeks ago, and Looking Glass has been on the market for a while. They've just announced a very large, very large Looking Glass. And uh, what happens with Looking Glass is you see it, it's actually, um, it's a computer that has, it has a display that has depth to it. So I've got a very thin, you know, uh, very nice, you know, MacBook, uh, and it's got a very thin display here. This is very thick, but you can see depth in it. So it's got a three inch throw, two to three inches throw towards the user, uh, towards the person watching. And then you can also go behind. It can also have depth, you know, sort of behind, you know, uh, as well. And so when you look at it, instead of like my laptop looks flat as much as I go back and forth, you, everyone in Zoom, you know, you all, all of you looks flat as well. Um, but here in the actual looking glass, you can actually get these really cool kind of perspectives as you shift uh, back and forth. Uh, so it's some kind of very fun. I don't know if it's multi-layer from the chat. Don't know. But uh, it's definitely fun, very interesting. And I can easily see like all laptops shipping with something that has this kind of depth. Because once you, it's kind of like, I remember Don Norman years ago saying, well, once you had a color monitor, then, you know, there was just no going back. You didn't need the color, but, you know, you wanted it. That's going to be definitely true with uh, with um, the spatial, you know, kind of spatial computing these these depth displays. LumaPad, I have not, and I have not uh, tried Luma. I haven't tried Google Glass in a couple years. I have not tried Luma at all. But the advertisement means that they seem to be projecting in front of the screen. We'll see. I don't know. I haven't gotten mine yet. 
Uh, but I, it's definitely worth checking the videos out, you know, after the after the talk. Um, and uh, yeah, there's definitely some really interesting stuff that has to happen. You know, your interpupillary distance uh, is really key uh, for getting a really good stereo um, effect. And that's, you know, really, you know, highly true in VR as well as, you know, these AR glasses. And these AR glasses tend to be less, um, less flexible. Then, uh, the, but you need them less because it's a flat screen. And you don't have two Fresnel lenses that you do on a VR headset. And then uh, the Illumina split looking glass is just left to right. It isn't really top to bottom. So you don't have that going up and down. Yeah, it's kind of like, uh, it's, it's, I, it's, I don't think it's, it's, it's like this, the old fashioned, you know, like, um, you know, that, that had the little multiple lenses or the, uh, the zigzaggy kind of stripes of plastic. So you could, you know, you had the little, like little blinking, you know, character or something like that. It kind of feels like that, but it's a different tech. I'm not sure what the technology is. Um, so, but yeah, it's really, it's really kind of cool. It might be corrugated, yeah, corrugated is a great word. It might be lenticular lenses. It might be something totally else, but here's a great use case for it. So now this is, this is looking glass and you can see that uh, a 3D scan, like a CAT scan is much more um, nice because you can actually like look as you move, the image changes as you look left and right on the scan. On the, on the, so you, see how, you can see how you're getting that perspective shift. It's stereo for both your eyes and then you, you shift back and forth. Uh, these are both a uh, illustration. This is another video by David uh, W. Sin, uh, Simi. He's really great. I really highly recommend uh, following him on Twitter as well. Yeah, I don't know what the LumaPad uses, and I haven't seen uh, it other than in the illustrations. One UX thing that is really important, though, is with a display surface. So if it's got depth or if it has throw, forward throw, what does the hand occlusion look like? Right. So if I, if the display surface is here and I have an object here. I want my hand to occlude it when I'm in front of that object, right? But then when I'm behind the object, I want the object to occlude the hand. And then if the object then zooms back past the glass, I can't hit the object. I can't touch the object. And so then I need a virtualized hand somehow that then again goes in front and in back of that virtual object. This is one of the really interesting you know, UI problems that will need to get uh, solved as we get more into this interactive um, display surface. Uh, the uh, looking glass has a solution. I don't didn't put it here because I'm a little bit I, I need to see it in person before I, <laughs> before I show it. But you can definitely check it out on looking glass uh, uh, his website looking glasses website. Uh, and uh, so then what's interesting about these these are photogrammetry scans. So this is not a vi this is a video of a 3D scan. So I can move a camera a virtual camera through this uh, 3D model and create any kind of video I want. And that's a very interesting uh, reality that we are you know, just about starting to live in. And in this case, you can see like none of the trees were cut down when I made the scan in the center um, of the font sculpture head. You know, like none of all those trees are gone now. It's like, ugh. anyway, anyway. Um, yeah. And then the other thing is that we get you know, as we move through, uh, as we move through the uh, the world, this is a uh, a hologram, if you will. Basically, you're putting, you're mapping an AR texture to a, uh, in this case, a fairly opaque one, uh, to a real world um, uh, model. So this is a you know San Francisco uh, floor in a skyscraper, raw space. It's concrete, poured concrete from the elevator column all the way to the windows. But you can then take this uh, pad with our app and you can actually then, you know, kit it out or display it out in different uh, in different settings. So you can look at it can look like an office, it can look like medical, it could have different colors. And then we can do uh, audio tours as well using spatialized audio. Uh, so that is uh, another sort of like as we work through the world. So again, that world is part of our UI. And uh, this is even better like on a Magic Leap or on a, you know, on a set of uh, AR glasses because then you don't have to hold the, the the display service in front of you. iPads are great because they're 13 inches, which is bigger than my original, you know, MacBook, Mac, <laughs> well, my original Mac Plus, I guess, is the first, my first, like, computer that I actually owned. Um, but uh, we've got, you know, uh, it's much better if you just have your glasses and then you can use both hands or free to do some fun uh, interaction. So last little topic, just really quickly, as I want to talk about spatial audio and a little bit about haptics. Uh, so with Bose AR, which is what I uh, talked about um, uh, earlier is that uh, there are these uh, these glasses and uh, they have a speaker here in the um, 
in the in the uh, in the arm for the glasses, and they have a motion sensor, so you can you can sense your motion. So I can put you know the in this case for unscrambling the oracle, I put the chicken fairy godmother here at two o'clock high because that felt like a good spot um, for a narrator. And either and as I as I move, I can actually fix her in space, so it's you know as I rotate, or I can rotate and just kind of leave her behind, or in this case you know walk. So it's a it's a choose your adventure. There's about two miles of content. And you play it uh, with um, with your uh, you know with with a set of these, and uh, I'm going to try and you know port it to another another hardware that's a little more available. And you uh, basically you help your chicken fairy godmother find her lost hubby and chicks. So you walk uh, you, and you do this as you walk. So it's connected to a smartphone, so it requires a smartphone to play. And in order to design the UX for this, so this was uh, my first shot at doing like a really like an audio only, basically an audio only UI, which is um, which is great. You know, I really want, I've always wanted to design an audio only game. And so it was an audio first game. And in order to do that, I had to figure out what was the pixel resolution for audio? Because I wanted positional audio. I used the Unity and the, um, un, uh, and the uh, resonance plugin. And what was the, you know, like how many positions could I, could I get? Like, what was it, you know, how many around and, you know, how, how, you know, how would it, how would it be to work? Because I wanted to use the positional information to create audio UIs. Uh, and so I created this word called an oxal, like a pixel, but an oxal, an audio, an audio pixel. And I needed to know how big and how many of them. I've got much more information if people really wanted to nerd out about it. But essentially, I created this uh, uh, shorthand for designing the user experience of uh, an audio first uh, interaction with uh, something called uh, red. So basically, there was rotation. So there's rotation of the head. Uh, there was the elevation above the surface of the horizon. We can't really hear too much directional directionality anyway below. You can put it there, but it's not it's not nearly as fidel. You don't have that fidelity, at least in the testing that we did uh, above you. And then distance. So what I did is I broke it down into five positions of rotation that seemed to be about as many as I could really distinct uh, distinctly tell that were different. So it's like how close can buttons be together? You can always like make a button glow. You can't do that with a an audio button though because an audio button if it's glowing all the time in audio you know that's annoying that's like that's really like it's a loud sound and you know you can't have all five glow it doesn't work so we had to do we had to get a very smaller thing so it's about 45 positions we found and only one to three at a time could be active so audio has some really interesting uh, characteristics i can give you know can and have given whole talks on this um, but the most important thing is if you have spatialized, if you're dealing with holograms and spatialize the visuals, you've got to spatialize the audio as well. Most of us, um, most, uh, in, most audio design is like really to put, you know, uh, is to put the audio like in your head. So like when you do music, it's mostly mixed to feel really good, like it's inside versus, but we want it for XR, do we want it to be outside, uh, outside your head and in the real, you know, in the real world running around. Um, I have an illustration here. It doesn't work too well because uh, it's going to be mono, so you can't really tell the difference. But uh, this is sort of together? like how it works in action, is that as she's walking, so this is what you'd see on the phone, uh, then you could actually, you know, hear her uh, move around day. As, you, uh, about, as, you, as you move the glasses. As you look, look left and right, she will actually rotate around your head. You won't be able to hear that now in Zoom. Uh, if you want to hit me up for a link, I've got a link up on YouTube the the that you can actually hear it, at least in stereo. And that's a stereo go, port of a six-stop, six-direction of freedom audio experience. Again, because we can walk through that hey, audio. Chicken. And lastly, just to wrap up, is that with haptics is also important for immersion and very hard to do with free. You need, you need some kind of wearable. Or you can use like ultra haptics, like sound waves and stuff like that to feel a little bit uh, to increase, increase immersion when you're like looking at holograms. Um, if you do have the ability to put on something though, like uh, we've got a client that we've been working with, is that you can actually create these Princess Leia holograms you can touch. And so you can get surface textures and directional force and you can actually reach into that cube, if you will, and then rotate it or feel the difference. Well, in this case, you know, feel the difference between like leather and zipper and you know, fabric and all that. It can be really quite uh, empowering, just like having really good spatialization to make holograms more believable. So some quick takeaways is that we want to have direct, in, for holograms, we want to have direct interaction with our hands, with our bodies. We need to integrate those holograms in the real world in a number of ways. And we want to, like, as we get holographic displays, so it isn't just, uh, it might be like we have the glasses is one solution. The other solution is that there's an, an object outside of us that's projecting, like Minority Report, projecting into the room. 
uh, some different uh, constraints there, and then spatial audio and, and, and haptics. Uh, so, and then there are, you know, other topics, but we have a few minutes, I think, for Q&A, or did I run all the way out of time? But uh, I'm happy to take some questions. Um, thank you, folks. Uh, thank you, folks, for listening. Um, and, uh, but yeah, let's see, was that the last slide? I think that was the last slide. Yeah. Um, there we go. Yep. Yeah. So if you want to contact me, this is my email and this is my Twitter. Uh, feel free to reach out. And here are some of our games. You can also download the Four Keys to Fun at 4k2f.com. So thanks everybody for uh, for for listening. It's been it's great, and I'm happy to stay for more questions if you want. So we have a question about how oh from Ted uh, to how do we test uh, mixed reality? Oh yeah 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 okay. Um, so yeah, so how do we test mixed reality interactions? So do you mean like uh, with the Microsoft branded mixed reality headset or with mixed reality uh, interactions? How do we user test that? So what I've been doing is I've been, you know, giving, um, testing it myself, like looking at the laptop, you know, running it to the, the uh, headset and then I will either interact with it here with my hands or I will like stand up and then go into the space, interact with it, make mental notes and then come back. And, and then work again. Um, I don't have a way of mocking it up, um, but if you've got, uh, if you have like a, what's really fun about mixed reality is you can also do, use tilt brush or now it's called multi brush. And you can actually go in, into VR and actually you can do line sketches of 3D, uh, you know, user interfaces or whatever you want to uh, with, uh, with, with that program. And it can be quite, quite fun. Um, and then there's a comment uh, from Lisa about Olivetto's. Very true, very true. Olivetto's is a restaurant at uh, Market Hall uh, near, I'm in the uh, North Oakland in Rockridge. And they have a really interesting audio array of speakers and microphones. And so what it will do is it will actually, the microphone will kind of get the ambient sound of things that are going on and then rebroadcast in through the speakers. It has a number of settings. But then it 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 it, um, uh, it, it broadcasts out this a speaker through the speaker. I'm thinking using phase cancellation. I'm not really. I can't remember which one it was. Um, but basically that yeah. Bas so basically you can't hear. You hear that there's noise around you, but you can't actually hear the conversation of the table next to you. Uh, so that was a really interesting use of uh, audio, spatialized audio in a sense. It was a spatial. It was a space, and then they did some really cool things with microphones and with. Um, uh, speakers to create additional sense of privacy, but yet you still feel like you were uh, you were interacting with other other folks. Uh, great. So, so I um, had one question for yeah. you. Thanks. Um, the, um, uh, so for somebody to get involved, right, and make something mm -hmm. for AR or VR. Yeah. Um, what would you say are the you know, three things or the five things that you need? Well, one of the easiest things uh, to do, and again, I'm kind of, you know, looking at, uh, I'm sort of looking at the world through Snapchat because I've got, you know, I've been working with these, but uh, making uh, augmented AR lenses for uh, either like through Snap or through, um, or through uh, Facebook's Spark AR or through TikTok, which announced last week, they're supporting it as well. So just making a simple, you know, simple like, you know, face, you know, lens where, you know, I put on like a little fairy hat or something like that uh, can be a really uh, simple way to get started in the AR world because the, uh, they come with the, these, uh, come with, they're very, they're very consumer friendly. And so they come with um, a lot of templates and stuff you can do right away. And like the Lens Studio 4 for Snapchat has garment se segmentation. Um, I'm using like the beta as well, but they have like, so that basically you can put, if you put the phone out here, it will actually cut the clothes, you know, cut the clothes outline even in 3D. So it will constantly track the clothes and then it can actually then replace it with uh, the pattern of your choice. So it can be a 3D model. Uh, it can be like you saw actually in those examples uh, or it can be like an illustration. So that's a, that's that's one great way. The other way is to uh, if you want to do, you know, get more in depth, then there's uh, the Unity and Unreal, you know, game engines. 
And those are um, those are a little bit those are a little bit more of a more of a heavy lift, but they are really nice. Um, they are really good because they have a lot of flexibility. So with Follow the White Rabbit, for example, I did uh, I did the um, I did the I did the uh, Brandon Jones did the the basic artwork for so the lovely room and a lot of the initial pickups, and I've taken over on the uh, you know more pickups on that side. And then I was the engineer, and so I designed that in Unity and coded it in Unity. And then I took it from, you know, from Gear VR to, you know, Oculus Go to the Rift to Vive to the Vive Focus to Magic Leap, all using the Unity engine. And I just created the, um, I created the basic sele uh, selection mechanic to be a module, if you will, very modular, so I could move it, you know, and replace it out with, you know, the different hardware, you know, when I moved it to a different, different hardware. So Unity and Unreal game engines are great, a great place to a great place to start. The other way is to also just do uh, we call them game jams or hackathons. So get together with uh, with people that you want to just make a, make an experience with, and even in a weekend or maybe it's maybe it's four weeks, uh, you can create a little uh, little experience. And so that's a great way to get um, uh, to get started. I learned a lot of Unity just doing YouTube videos, and that's also true with like uh, Lens Studio and you know the other the other um, platforms I've been working on and, and Unreal as well. Thank you. Um, I know Lisa was asking about the brush that you mentioned earlier. Oh yeah, tilt brush. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So tilt <laughs> brush is a is a great experience. It's um it was one of the early, uh, really the early big successes in in virtual reality, and so it, you have two hand controllers, and one is your palette. Uh, so they have a palette UI that comes out. And then you have your selection, which is your brush, and then you can um, you can change color, you can change the shape of the brush to be like a rainbow brush or a watercolor brush or a sparkle brush or a you know a fur brush, and then you can uh, then you you just you just you just move in air. Like if I were to draw, I could draw a rainbow above me, right, like that, and then I could also draw a rainbow like around me, like that. And then the rainbow would all you know would be those lines would be I'd be inside the painting. So it's kind of like Mary Poppins, uh, where you jump into the sidewalk chalk drawings. You can actually draw around you. And uh, Google dumped it uh, or de de uh, deprecated or open sourced it, you know, a couple, several months ago, maybe a year ago. And uh, it's now called Multibrush. And now you can actually, it's awesome because now two people or more people can actually be in the same drawing. And so if you think you're on a stage, you can think of you, you're on this virtual stage and you don't have to be in the same room even. You can be, but you don't have to be. Uh, and a physical room, you're both in the same session though. And then you could be uh, in this virtual like theater set, just imagine, you know, blank set. And then you could be drawing trees and, you know, um, you could be drawing trees and set pieces all together. And so I make a stroke and then you can edit it. Uh, it's really, it's really quite an amazing experience. Uh, they have some stuff like on uh, on Snap. They have like a similar sort of thing where you can on the Snap Spectacles where you can you know sort of like a use with a nose kind of a nose brush <laughs> type of thing, where you can tap and then you can you know draw you know all around and then change uh, change out um, uh, change out different experiences. But yeah, the lenses creating lenses AR lenses is a lot easier than creating a game you know in in Unity and Unreal. Yeah, multi brush. Yeah, Jamboard, probably it's like Jamboard in VR. Uh, the, well, with Tilt Brush, there are performances. So Rosie Summers is a really great uh, Tilt Brush artist. Uh, uh, Teek, T-E-E-K, is an amazing Tilt Brush artist. And Joanna Lowe, she's at Splash Mango. Those are all amazing Tilt Brush artists. And so they've taken it to a level of performance. So where you have, uh, you know, you just, you just watch them. They're just amazing uh, as they create their, create, their, create their things, create their work. Uh, if you were at Virtual Burning Man last week, uh, there was a lot of, lot of stuff going on on the virtual playa uh, that came out of Tilt Brush. Uh, uh, Juliana Lowe, she had an amazing, um, an amazing piece called Sincerista. Anyway, you see it, if you look up Burning Man, on, um, there's a lot of her, a lot of her work is the, is the cover, is the cover, a lot of the coverage um, was of her experience. Awesome. I had one more question, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, if anybody else uh, wants to ask, please feel free to uh, post and unmute yourself. But, um, you know, with the whole like interaction model of kind of primarily uh, relying on your, at least for now, arms, 
mm-hmm. hands. Uh, it just feels like it can get tiring and you'll end up with a workout. Um, oh, sure. So any like, you know, principles, considerations, right, for if this actually ever has to be used, you know, for extended periods oh, of time. Well, I, I think that's really interesting. There's a whole, world, like a, a whole interesting like spectrum there. It's a great, it's a great question. Uh, so in AR, like Pokemon Go, if people have heard of that, that's an AR game. Uh, you don't have to play it, the AR part, but they they design the interaction so that you can't, so your arm doesn't get tired. So it's only like, you know, a, like 20 seconds or 30 seconds. It's not a minute, it's not five minutes because your hand would get tired, right? Your arm would get tired. Same thing, like if you remember the old, like, you know, the old touchscreen things, like, oh yeah, everyone's going to be touchscreen. We're all going to have touchscreen and all that. It's like, nope, we're not going to because this is, you know, a keyboard is much easier. You know, this is not, you know, you get really tired. So with uh, VR, you're definitely using your whole body to do things. Uh, that has become a benefit, a user benefit, especially with the pandemic. So uh, a popular game called Beat Saber, where you're throwing lightsabers and slicing blocks in half, stuff like that, is, um, is one interaction. I mean, it, that's a, basically people do that for arm day. And then they do Pistol Whip, which is a virtual reality shooting gallery, but you have to crouch, you have to duck and that's leg day for a lot of people. Or they just do Supernatural by Chris Milk. And uh, that is a virtual trainer. And you take it, you basically take it on this amazing video footage that's all vacation. So you go through the Alps, you go through the beach and all of that. And it's become, your was one of the first uh, cross game trackers. So you would do your cardio workout. So you would have this uh, virtual wristband from your, and it would track your, track your workout based on like how much your arms were moving. And now that is actually, you know, Oculus or Facebook's actually grabbed that. And that's part of now uh, the basic, uh, in, the basic, in the base layer, the operating system. And so any game you play, you can actually add to your calorie count meter or your uh, um, thing meter. Um, there's definitely, yeah, your fit. It's awesome. It's awesome. I really love, I love Six and the, um, uh, the, the, the yeah, they also did Live. They do a really nice, really nice job. Six Live did it. Um, there are some reports of injuries, just like we had with the Wii, right? So definitely, I mean, I've bumped myself a couple of times. We, what we do is we tend to map out in fully occluded VR, we map out a, um, a room for you that you can uh, inhabit, that you can be in. And that is a guardian. And then you're moving, you know, you're moving around uh, in, in that space. And then you, you do it so that you aren't, you know, pushing. Like, I would make sure that I didn't hit this lamp by making sure that the ground underneath the lamp had a, you know, had a nice, enough clearance. So I didn't bonk it as I was like playing Beat Saber wildly or Audio Trip wildly. Uh, but that was true with the with the Wii, and uh, I've hurt myself once pretty hard. But um, when my companion guardian, whatever, it shifted, and so I like was playing Beat Saber really hard, and went boom, and then right on cut the bottom of a desk, my desk. It's like, unfortunately, I was holding a controller because then um, I didn't break my finger because <laughs> it, it it spread the shock right uh, through the controller. Oh, yeah, yeah. But yeah, the other thing is that if you are looking at, you know, hand interaction, uh, that's interesting, right? That's, you know, it's not, um, is it as repetitive? That's also why I said puppet mouth and not this, because I think this is really, I find that this is really stressful, but this is not, uh, it's not as, um, as stressful for moving, moving things around. Any other questions or anything? I actually have a question, uh, Nicole. Thank you so much for this uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, you covered so much. Um, so my question is a little bit uh, maybe from the Uber level of looking at things. Uh, as you know, 3D TVs uh, miserably failed. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yeah, one of the primary reasons for that was uh, using the goggles or, you know, uh, the, uh, um, the, 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 uh, glasses that uh, didn't really engage people, uh, not not in terms of uh, watching experience, but also the, the, that joint social collaborative experience. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I, I find it actually quite striking because uh, one of the things that uh, in interaction design is not just interacting with technology and the objects, but interacting with other people. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really, uh, that, that really needs to be fostered. Yep. Um, so I, I see all these new technologies coming up, uh, Oculus and, and all the other ones. Um, I don't think they really get us to where we should be. 
but mm -hmm. at the same time, we don't necessarily have the technology to be in a holodeck, right? Which is probably the ideal environment. At some point, at some point yeah. It, right. So I, I was wondering about your take on this as, um, for example, Oculus. I mean, I, 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 I'm not in the game world. Uh, I know a little bit because of the friends. Mm -hmm. but uh, still doesn't have that uh, widespread acceptance uh, by the gamers as, uh, as projected. So mm -hmm. what, what is your take on all this? Well, I think that just started going back to what uh, you're talking about, like 3D TV, for example, I think that's a really great, that's a really great starting point of, for a conversation in that the, when that came out, it was really a, it's a technology I remember the CES very vividly that year. It was like, it was 3D televisions and Facebook was spray painted on every booth, right? <laughs> and the, uh, the value proposition of having a TV in 3D wasn't there because you couldn't interact with it. And you, know, you couldn't interact with it. And what was the 3D there for? And you had to wear, like you said, the special glasses. So there was an inconvenience factor. Um, and so it doesn't, uh, and then the projection, you know, wasn't, you know, you know, coming out into the room, like, you know, like a holodeck, like a holodeck would. So it only, technology only makes sense as if it's, if it's going to deliver, you know, more value than the, um, than the previous, than the technology it replaces. So basically the use with case was like, okay, here, you've got the flat screen TV, you replace it with a 3d TV, mm. and then you're just going to sit in the same couch and then have the same movie, essentially, almost the same movie. Uh, and there isn't that much, it wasn't like going from black and white to color or to go from, you know, 72 DPI to 8K. There wasn't enough, enough there. When you add interaction, which is what all of the, uh, pretty much all the examples I've shown today, then that's, then that's different because, I mean, if it's designed well, you can still just throw, you know, you know, a lot of people use, you know, put on, you know, like a, uh, a Viva Riff and just watch Netflix on a flat screen inside VR, which is kind of weird. I don't know why people do that. <laughs> I don't know why people do that, but people do. Uh, the, the big thing though is to ask is like, well, would this experience, could this experience happen just with a movie, uh, a, YouTube, a flat YouTube movie, movie, you know, then great, then just make a flat YouTube movie. But if it can't, like for example, when I'm walking on the CCA campus, and I want the user to be able to like look up and then see the tree canopy and then see the, um, you know, see the buildings and then see, and then like hit a button and then like all the trees get cut down. And then, then what does that feel like? And they're standing like on the, they could actually stand, be standing on the real campus or maybe they're standing in their living room. That's very different because I'm communicating, I'm telling a story uh, and I'm telling a story that involves depth. Uh, it's kind of like we have a box of crayons and, you know, we've had for, you know, you know, for hundreds of years, we've had a red, a green, and a blue. And that's like, we've created all this amazing art with it, whether you're in animation or movies or CGI, whatever. But uh, with VR and AR, you have this depth crayon, this, this fourth color, if you will. And it's the, you know, that Z axis, that one that's going in and out. And if the, if that depth isn't used in every layer of the experience, then it's really not XR. It's really not, in my opinion, anyway. It's really not uh, not XR. So, for example, if I were just to do asteroids, for example, in you know on the spectacles in 3D, but they were still like on a plane, you know, coming down and going left and right, uh, you know that that wouldn't make a lot of sense. But if the you know asteroids were coming in in three space, you know, all around my room, then maybe that might be more fun because I've got it. I can dodge them. I can I can look this way and I can get that one, or I can hide behind the couch and they can't see me. So th those kinds of things uh, might make it more fun. Um, okay. but, uh, yeah. And then like in the doctor's case, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of really good uh, enterprise. So for example, Shelly Peterson from Lockheed Martin, and they're assembling the uh, Orion spacecraft using HoloLens too. And the, what they're able to do is there are, you know, there's, there's hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands of fasteners on the, on the Orion right. spacecraft. And so if, uh, if you and I are sitting there trying to figure out like where this one, <laughs> this one goes, uh, you know, we look at our, we look at our, our laptop or our, our pad or our paper printout. And then I have to like, look at it. I have to read the part number. I have to interpret that. And then I have to vocalize it. And I have to compare it with the thing in my hand, the real thing in my hand. And then I talk to you and then you listen, you know, you look at the same or your copy of the manual. And so there's all of these like interaction lines, whereas if we both have HoloLens on and the, the assembly manual or the question manual is virtualized. We just say, you and I just say, oh, you know, that goes there, mm -hmm. done. 
you know, we haven't seen like those, these 90, she's getting like these 98% improvements in, you know, productivity and reducing errors and that sort of stuff. We haven't seen any of that since like the early days of multimedia, of interactive multimedia. Uh, so it's, you definitely want to have the, the use cases uh, there uh, for, you know, for it to make sense. A flat screen projection is great for the medical field. So you can do a doctor training that way. You can do, um, you can also do just like having a 3D CGI, um, uh, sorry, a 3D uh, MRI or a 3D CAT scan, something like that, where you can actually look at it together and move through it. Really, really interesting, really interesting stuff. Um, and that, there's a big benefit for that. Um, but just watching 3D movies on Netflix is not, is not so much of a use case. It's not so much of a use case. Right. But if I can grab in and then like uh, assemble things, I like can follow the white rabbit and then hit power. And now I've got this device that's running and that's projecting. And now, now I've got the Eiffel Tower in my room. You know, then that's, that's quite a bit. That's, that's, that's fun. That's a different dimension entirely. Do you think there's going to be significant cognitive load on the users for extended amount of uh, usage? time-wise because I think it's um, some really fun I remember back in the day uh when there used to be really dragged down fights in at Kai um on whether or not the humans can uh, process more than seven colors at a time when color displays were first starting to come out and I think we're going to get a, a, some of that kind of an argument you know here it's like oh well you know there'll be like so much you know it's like now it's 3D it's like even more data coming at us and you could definitely do bad design that way. But if you mm -hmm. take more of a, you know, Edward Tuff sort of approach and, you know, eliminate the chart junk, don't make it 3D just because it could be 3D, uh, but use the 3D like we saw with the uh, Flow Immersive. They've got great videos on their website and follow their Twitter, too. Um, but they are, uh, you know, they're using depth to communicate something that you can't get on a flat piece of paper. Mm. And uh, in training, for example, I mean, if you've got a 3D task, then a 3D display makes sense, right? If you have if you have visualization where you can do uh, where you can use that, you're, we're always also already using false color, but false color is not quite enough. We need another dimension to put you know some information in, so that depth can really can really help. But it isn't like just spray paint, you know, uh, 3D television or you know XR over over everything. Uh, you want it to be. It's really good for spatially aware tasks. You can also do really great training with um, like, uh, like, you know, irradiating a tumor. You could have this um, prop that's like auger, like jello with the, uh, with the tumors you're supposed to get as little grapes or something inside. And then you have your probe and then you can have your probe go in and then you can have a, an AR with glasses. You can have an AR display around the probe and giving you all kinds of data because you have to get the angle right mm -hmm. and the going in right so that you hit it so you're not tearing through a bunch of tissue trying to hit the thing that you're and then you need that force feedback which is the, the physical prop is providing haptics would be even more amazing um and there was another example of um of that uh well welding i learned how to weld in vr so i put on a welder's helmet and it had a vr display inside and then I had a physical prop, which is a real welding. And there's not real acetylene, but I could see it and it tracked. And I had to like get the angle right. And I had to, you know, had the right heat. And then I had to have the right, you know, um, filament or whatever that is. And I had to go at the right rate and the right angle at the right speed to get a really good solid, you know, weld. And, uh, you know, you take it off and it's just like an I-beam and, you know, um, a prop, a toy prop. But in this, in the headset, I could see, I mean, I could set things on fire and, you know, all kinds of, you know, or whatever, you know, I could, I could do really damage, but I don't do damage in the real world. So that's, those are really solid use cases for, uh, for XR, for user experiences. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, there's a really great, uh, yeah, Kichi Masuda stuff. Definitely check, check it out. I, I, I uh, started the talk with that. I love it. I love him as a creator. And I think he's making these great statements of like, we don't want to do to your point of like, uh, you know, a little bit to your point, Al, is that, you know, it's like, um, Al, it's, it's, uh, you don't want to do AR just because. So you could put, you know, all of these advertisements, you know, everywhere. And that's, you know, all the, all, you go down the grocery store and all of the uh, cereal boxes are talking to you. Uh, that, you know, isn't necessarily going to be, uh, that isn't going to be delivering value. So I go like, what is the human centric, go back to the human, those human, basic human centric questions. Those don't change uh, if you're mapping it into VR but you want to, or AR, but you want to be sure that you're adding, you know, you're adding value. And it isn't just like you're getting a better coupon by experiencing all this stuff, but that it isn't, um, uh, that it isn't just over, you know, information overload. So, I mean, to your point, you know, you definitely, there's that physical overload if you're moving around more, 
And there can be some mental cognitive overload with multiple experiences happening all at once. Like if you go into Times Square, for example, and there are virtual real estate companies and these uh, that you could sell, like you could sell different versions of Times Square, different overlays of Times Square. So very important landmark. And you can have these different. So one might be a murder mystery experience. One might be a shopping. One might be a, uh, you know, find a good restaurant or do a show or a virtual show. Um, you don't want all of those experiences happening in time, AR experiences in Times Square happening at the same time. You know, the advertisement for, you know, Game of Thrones or something like you have to be able to like as the user intelligently switch between them and kind of like layers in a book. You know, you need to be able to um, just access one and then you want to have a consistent experience in that world, in that AR world for that. So if it was a mystery adventure that was in the 30s or something, you'd want it to all be remapped to look like we're in the 30s in New York City, not not, you know, less neon. And then you'd want to be able to, you know, meet these virtual characters and or clues or whatever, pick up these clues that are all that. And you don't want that interrupted with the um, uh, the uh, the latest, uh, you know, the latest, uh, you know, Broadway show or a, uh, a um, uh, an ad for, you know, you know, uh, an ad for uh, a, uh, you know, an ad for like, a, you know, a different restaurant or a you know, different different thing. Maybe we can take one last question from Lisa. Um, yeah. uh, you touched on sound as well as haptics and visuals. Anything going on regarding the uh, olfactory reality terminology, smell, I guess. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> right, yeah, the coffee cup, yeah, that's one. Uh, yeah, so uh, smell vision has been around for a while. It's come in and out, you know, just like 3D goggles has come in and out. Uh, and there, there's some really interesting challenges with that. So audio is wonderful because it's like goes right to the brain as far as like, you know, it's great emotional responses. So Walter Murch is a famous sound designer and he does amazing work with that. And that's what he said, Nicole, I interviewed him once. He said, yeah, Nicole, it's like the, the thing about the uh, ears is that, you know, the eyes blink, but the ears never do. So there aren't as many barriers to that. The thing with smell is challenging is it's a chemical, uh, it's a chemical response. And so you have to have, you have these air circulation problems, issues, because you need to get the new molecules in and then out, and then, then they become old and then they need to go out so that we get the next new set of molecules in to match what's happening on the screen or in the world. And that can be super challenging for, uh, for people to deliver. So there's some all, all kinds of fancy, like if you're, if you're already in a headset, you pretty much don't care what's, what's, you know, sticking out here. So they've got these like little dispensers, like little pet, not pet dispensers, but little, little perfume dispensers here. And that will like do three or four different smells. It can be effective. I, I don't think that the, it's really worth the hardware and the, the effect isn't as worth it as the hardware, unless you were doing something that was really, um, that was really unique. Um, it's hard to tell us for me, it was hard to tell a story with smell, but it was easy to enhance immersion. Uh, but there are, uh, with, with smell, but there are only certain locations that have a distinct smell and certain, you know, so it would be, it would be, you know, kind of challenging. Yes. Yeah, since we're already asking full time. <laughs> yeah. And you can't smell anything, you know, or you can't smell a lot through the masks, um, through, through the, uh, through the paper mat or the paper and the other masks. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a, it's real challenging. I think with haptics, I think there's more storytelling capabilities with haptics and, uh, as well as obviously with sound than there is with, uh, with, with, with smell. Yeah. But, uh, anyway, so that's, that's it. Any other, any other, any other questions? If we don't have any, um, any, you know, thoughts you want to leave us with? uh before we head out oh yeah yeah well it's been it's been great great to you know great to be here and i think that you know i think having conversations with you know when you encounter you know projects that are requiring you know some some depth some 3d you know having conversations just like going back to the fundamentals of like what is the human centered you know experience you know how can we uh create a value for our individual users as opposed to um creating a system it's like you know living in somebody's investment which is a lot of the a lot of software is starting to feel that way uh what can we do to push it you know push it back to features that really um provide a lot of quality and a lot of value to you know individuals one of our mottos is uh, unlocking human potential through play and i really um, hope that we can all design you know a better metaverse with that in mind 
Oh, great. Thank you so much for an engrossing topic and discussion. Um, have a good night, everybody. Yeah, Hope wonderful. to see you next month. Feel free to reach out to me on my socials or uh, uh, my email. And it's been great seeing everybody. Before you go, Nicole, before yeah. you go, what are we looking at behind you? What oh, are we looking at? So, um, well, one of them is my uh, one of them is my background. Um, this is my this is my game. Uh, you know, follow the white rabbit, um, oh. which is like this one. Okay. So this is what it looks like. Oh. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is a cafe in Paris, and then the other one is my uh, the one behind me, directly behind me is uh, is Tilt World, and so this is an iOS game. And uh, you play Flip and who eats carbon out of the air and gathers seeds uh, to uh, plant trees in the island of Madagascar. So there's a whole bunch of different, it's a restoration bio, um, it's a bio uh, restorative using bioremediation. So we you know, use mushrooms to, uh, to detoxify the soil, then, you know, grasses to hold the soil in place. And then uh, we fight things like, you know, uh, toxic, uh, you know, uh, toxic wastes and stuff like that until we create, you know, this eco mechanica uh, where we've got um, biology that's, you know, cleaning the cleaning the world. So yeah, so I've got yeah, so that's that's um that's and that, what we're looking at behind you. Yeah. What, so, what's behind you though right now? Right? Is that a, yeah? These that, are like exactly. scenes from Tilt World, right? Oh, these are these are screenshots from Is Tilt it World. A storyboard. Yeah, it's a, well, it's a sort of a storyboard. Yeah, okay. it's a collection of the backgrounds from Tilt World. Mm -hmm. And then this is a, a poster okay. for uh, for Follow the White Rabbit on the on that side. Oh, okay. And then there's the four keys Thank to you. fun. And then mm -hmm. there's like you know uh, where the magic leap used to be, and then the you know the Oculus Go. That's the where the rabbit ears are. The rabbit ear. That's um. You know, so I pick up that mm -hmm. headset. I actually go to Paris. And I wish I could do that. I wish I could just put the, it on everyone. Um, and we could all see, mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's not, it's really fun to be in, in 3D. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Oh, you're Thank welcome. you. You're welcome. Yeah, it was great. Great seeing everyone. Nice to see you, Gail, and, uh, and everyone. Thanks for- Have a uh, very good night, everybody. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much, Nicole. Oh, you're welcome. Have a good Did night. you have a question, Gail? Bye. Oh. Gail, you're about to speak. Uh, you're still muted. No, I'm just yeah, yeah. Uh, oh. excited to see it all and to hear it all, and uh, I'll be in touch. Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah, that would be great. That'd be great. Yeah, Nicole at okay. CEOdesign.com. I can put it in the chat. Got it. Yeah, and I'm uh, at Nicole Lazaro. Uh, on Twitter. So I do a lot of tweeting there if you want to see more examples. I've got a really great AR list if you want to see a lot of, uh, a lot of people, a lot of different, different stuff. Awesome. You'll yeah. see the recording if you want to share it with folks later on as well for anybody who oh, missed perfect. it. That sounds um, awesome. Awesome. Thank you again. Bye-bye now. All right. Take care, everyone. Have a